Welcome. Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you're at when this video finds you. Today, we start back up our spiritual warfare study with a special edition. We have been gone for a while, and in the previous chapters in our journey, we were going through the armor of God. We will, we will continue on after uh, we go through this special edition. Now, in our home Bible study, we have been going through the book of Revelation, chapter by chapter, verse by verse. Digging deep, going back into history, and looking at the events and the present to decipher what the future holds for mankind. We have discovered patterns, if you will, through scripture and history of the enemy. And we feel we have come up with a pretty good view of what has, is, and will go on. We have exposed early on in our Bible study who the whore of Babylon is and the beast she rides. Today, uh, we will start at the beginning and go through a brief history before we get into the scriptures of Revelations chapter 17 and 18. Now, as I stated earlier, we have uh, been studying this topic and we will immediately dig deep into the study. So if you're unfamiliar with this topic, I suggest you do some reading of scripture and research before watching this study. Go ahead and get into it now. In Genesis 3, 7, it says, Then the eyes of both of them were opened, and they knew that they were naked. And they sewed fig leaves together and made themselves coverings. Religion is man's attempt to cover himself with God. In Genesis 3, 21, it says, Also for Adam and his wife, the Lord God made tunics of skin and clothed them. God had to show them that a sacrifice needed to be made. Without the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, any kind of worship or to that degree is just religion, the spirit of religion. You need Jesus and his ultimate sacrifice in order to have that special connection with the Lord. Now we're going to go ahead and go into and we're going to go ahead and get into chapter uh, 17 of Revelation. The Horror of Babylon, a brief history piece. Now, before we get into it, we're going to go ahead and play um, the chapter all the way through. And this um, Bible study is going to be broken up into a couple of uh, chapters. So I um, hope you stay with it. One of the seven angels who had the seven bowls came and said to me, Come, I will show you the punishment of the great prostitute who sits by many waters. With her, the kings of the earth committed adultery, and the inhabitants of the earth were intoxicated with the wine of her adulteries. Then the angel carried me away in the spirit into a wilderness. There I saw a woman sitting on a scarlet beast that was covered with blasphemous names and had seven heads and ten horns. The woman was dressed in purple and scarlet and was glittering with gold precious stones and pearls. She held a golden cup in her hand, filled with abominable things and the filth of her adulteries. The name written on her forehead was a mystery. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of the abominations of the earth. I saw that the woman was drunk with the blood of God's holy people, the blood of those who bore testimony to Jesus. When I saw her, I was greatly astonished. Then the angel said to me, Why are you astonished? I will explain to you the mystery of the woman and of the beast she rides, which has the seven heads and ten horns. The beast which you saw once was, now is not, and yet will come up out of the abyss and go to its destruction. The inhabitants of the earth, whose names have not been written in the book of life from the creation of the world, will be astonished when they see the beast, because it once was, now is not, and yet will come. This calls for a mind with wisdom. The seven heads are seven hills on which the woman sits. There are also seven kings. Five had fallen, one is, 
the other has not yet come. But when he does come, he must remain for only a little while. The beast who once was, and now is not, is an eighth king. He belongs to the seven and is going to his destruction. The ten horns you saw are ten kings who have not yet received the kingdom, but who for one hour will receive authority as kings along with the beast. They have one purpose and will give their power and authority to the beast. They will wage war against the lamb, but the lamb will triumph over them because he is Lord of lords and king of kings. And with him will be his called, chosen, and faithful followers. Then the angel said to me, The waters you saw where the prostitute sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and languages. The beast and the ten horns you saw will hate the prostitute. They will bring her to ruin and leave her naked. They will eat her flesh and burn her with fire. For God has put it into their hearts to accomplish his purpose by agreeing to hand over to the beast their royal authority until God's words are fulfilled. The woman you saw is the great city that rules over the kings of the earth. All right. So that's chapter 17. Um, we're going to go ahead and get into it here. So before we go on, I want to share with you a little clip um, of Chuck, Mis Chuck Missler on prophecy. This was taken off of one of his um, teachings on uh, chapter 17 and 18. Well, isms here. Now, remember something else uh, uh, that may be useful as you stu study your Bible. Most of us think of prophecy as prediction and fulfillment. Prediction and fulfillment. That's the Greek mind, the Western mind. That's what we most of us think that way. And that's fine. There's nothing wrong with that. But the Hebrew mind sees something beyond that. To the Hebrew mind, prophecy is pattern. And the uh, rabbis are constantly sensitive, or try to be sensitive, to the patterns in the stories and patterns in the history. And, and there's many, many ways that the history patterns uh, 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 people, pattern uh, the lives of history, uh, of Israel, and vice versa, and so forth. And so we want to be sensitive to that. But something else about our study. Okay. I just wanted to share that because we got to realize that the book that we read out of, Holy Bible is ancient and it's Eastern. And here in the modern times in the Western world, we kind of take the interpretation into the Western modern way of thinking. And that's not how we're supposed to be thinking when we read this scripture. We need to take ourselves back and look at it as an ancient Eastern person <laughs> and to, uh, to be able to get a better. I believe a better interpretation of what the writer is trying to tell us. So I just wanted to share that here. He was saying that patterns, that prophecy, that there's there's patterns from the past, and they've been happening throughout history, and they're going to continue into the future. So we need to look to those patterns in in history to get some more clues to what's going to ha what's happening now and what's hap when what's going to happen into the future. I wanted to share that. Oh, well, isms here. About that. Okay. So, 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 with that being said, to understand where you are going, sometimes you need to go back to see where you have came from. Now, remember, I said if you're unfamiliar with this topic, this video is going to dive right into it. So, you might have to go back and do a little bit of research. But there's going to be plenty of research here for you guys to, to dig into. Okay. So, there was a first. There was the first one world political and religious system in the past. And in Genesis, in Genesis we read that is of Samar, Nimrod and Samaramis. Nimrod and Samaramis, we were um, the first one world political and religious system. So like we've been, like I said, we've been studying this for a while. So um, we'll get into a brief history and then we'll get right into it. Through time, we have had many peoples, tongues, 
and nations. When God scattered the nations in Genesis, these people took their view on politics and religion with them throughout the earth. There has been many gods, quote unquote, with many names and stories in these civilizations. We will try to weed through these stories to find a line of truth, aligning it all with scripture. There is always an origin to things, and we will discover we can find the origin to these many gods, quote unquote, in this study. Now, as we know um, in our studies that the first Antichrist is Nimrod, was Nimrod. He is a biblical figure mentioned in the book of Genesis and books of Chronicles, the son of Cush, and therefore a great-grandson of Noah. Nimrod was described as a king in the land of Shinar, which is Mesopotamia. The Bible states that he was a mighty hunter before the Lord and began to be mighty in the earth. Later, extra-biblical traditions identified Nimrod as the ruler who commissioned the construction of the Tower of Babel, which led to his reputation as a king who was rebellious against God. Family secrets. We're going to go back and, and try to get some, um, dig for some uh, clues in this cold case file. So, Genesis 5, 32 indicates that Noah became the father of Shem, Ham, and Japheth at the age of 500 years old but does not list in detail their specific years. Noah was 600 years old at the time of the flood in Genesis 7. Now, Genesis 9, 20 through 27. Okay, we're going to look for some clues here. I'm, I'm, I'm coming to something here. So Genesis 9, 20 through 27 says, And Noah began to be a farmer, Excuse me, and he planted a vineyard. Then he drank of the wine and was drunk and became uncovered in his tent. And Ham, the father of Canaan, saw the nakedness of his father and told his two brothers outside. But Shem and Japheth took a garment, laid it on both their shoulders, and went backward and covered the nakedness of their father. Their faces were turned away, and they did not see their father's nakedness. So Noah awoke from his wine and knew what his younger son had done to him. Then he said, Cursed be Canaan, a servant of servants, he shall be. Uh, he shall be to his brethren. And he said, Blessed be the Lord um, to, excuse me, blessed be the Lord, the God of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. May God enlarge Japheth, and may he dwell in his tents, in the tents of Shem, and may Canaan be his servant. Now, I don't know about you, but there seems to be more going on in this scripture than they're putting on here, okay? Now, when you look into this, there's a number of different interpretations of what's going on here. And I'm just going to give you those three. I'm not going to get in depth in the, in, into them because it's not really pertaining particularly to this, this study. So one of them is that Ham seen his father naked, that Noah got drunk and got drunk in his tent, got naked for whatever reason. Ham seen him. Ham said, hey, brothers, come check him out, laughed at him, whatever it might be. And then, you know, the brothers went and covered him up. Another interpretation is that Ham had sex with Noah's wife. And the reason people come to that conclusion is because in Leviticus, there is, um, how do I say it? There's words like, um, where's it at? Saw the nakedness. Right here. Saw the nakedness of his father. Now, and when it, Uses those words in Leviticus, it means that they had sex with the spouse. So people have that interpretation. Some people have the interpretation that Ham went in there and had sex with both of them. There's interpretations that Ham had sex with just Noah. There's also interpretation that kind of aligns and goes parallel with other um, mythology stories that Ham went in there and castrated his father. Whatever your interpretation might be, that's not what we're, we're digging into here. But those are the different interpretations. The reason why I bring that up is because here, you notice that Ham's the one that does, does the deed. Whatever the deed is, um, 
Ham's the one that does it. That's that is not debatable. Um, my issue here is in verse twenty-five when he says, "Cursed be Canaan." Ham's the one that did the deed, but the uh, Canaan's the one that gets cursed. Okay, so we're gonna look a little bit into that. Now, remember, I'm going somewhere with this. So just bear with me. Now, Noah is the father of Ham. Ham is the father of Cush. Cush is the father of Nimrod. Now, I bring that to your attention because Nimrod is, as we stated, the first Antichrist that we know of in Scripture. Now, Ham is also the father of Canaan. because, As we just read in the Scripture I just read to you, the peoples that give the Israelites um, many trials and tribulations in the Old Testament. Now, you see these other names down here on the bottom. These are also called Canaanites in Scripture. Sometimes when Scripture says the Canaanites, it's just speaking of Canaan's group of people. And other times it's talking about a group of different people. It's kind of like saying, hey, you guys. So keep that in mind. Now, there's some issues going on here. Okay, Is there some bad blood going on here? Ham's the father of Cush who's the lineage of Nimrod, and then you got Canaan, and you got the Canaanites here, and they're all, um, how do you say, not pagans, but uh, yeah, they're, they're uh, Baal worshippers. We'll get into that right now. So let's go back to as in the days of Noah, okay? because we're reading here in Revelation chapter 17 and 18, and that's the end, uh, quote unquote, and um, our, our Lord Jesus Christ says that well, he'll come back when um, when it's as in the days of Noah. Okay, so um, so now it came to pass when men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them, that the sons of God saw the daughters of men, that they were beautiful, and they took wives for themselves, all who they chose. And the Lord said, "My spirit shall not strive with man forever." For he is indeed flesh, yet his days shall be 120 years. There were giants on the earth in those days, and also afterward, when the sons of God came into the daughters of men, and they bore children to them. Those were the mighty men who were of old, men of renown. Then the, then the Lord saw that the wickedness of man was great in the earth, and that every intent of the thoughts of his heart was only was only evil continually. And the Lord was sorry that he had made man on the earth, and he was grieved in his heart. So the Lord said, I will destroy man whom I have created from the face of the earth, both man and beast, creeping thing, and birds of the air. For I am sorry that I made that I have made them. But Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. This is the ge is the genealogy of Noah. Noah was a just man, perfect in his generations. Noah walked with God, and Noah begot three sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth. The earth also was corrupt before God, and the earth was filled with violence. So God looked upon the earth, and indeed it was corrupt. For all flesh had corrupted their way on the earth. And God said to Noah, the end of all flesh has come before me, for the earth is filled with violence through them. And behold, I will destroy them with the, with the earth. Now, we read here in scripture that men began to multiply on the face of the earth, and daughters were born to them. And the sons of God, they took wives for themselves of all whom they chose. Now, we know here that sons of God is pertaining to angels. And if you've done some study into this chapter, you realize that, that it's pertaining to the fallen angels. Okay. The mix, this mixing between, between um, the fallen angels and the women of the earth made giants on the earth in those days and also afterward. Notice that. We read that Noah was quote unquote just and perfect. Now, this doesn't mean that he was perfect. Okay? There's only one person that walked this earth that was perfect, and that's our Lord Jesus Christ. Now he sits at the right hand of the Father. But he's the only one that's walked this earth that's been perfect. 
And if you look into the tr the proper translation in the original text, it means in his in his geneal in his um, genealogy, meaning in it, I mean, excuse me, in his genes. Okay, he was um, his genes were perfect. Now, a lot of people say that's because he didn't mix with the, with others, whether it was animals, whether it was fallen angels, whether it was whatever they were doing at this time. His genes were clean. Okay, now we were. Uh, okay, back to our text here. We hear nothing of his wife, nor his children, or their wife's character. All we hear about here is about Noah. Okay? We don't hear nothing about anybody else. Then God tells Noah that it's, quote, unquote, the end of all flesh, but doesn't say anything about the spirit. All right? Now, we're getting somewhere, so bear with me here. There'll be a lot of history going, a lot of uh, history here. Okay, we, okay, we come to a speculation taking into consideration that Nimrod's father Cush who Canaanites worshipped as Baal and Canaan are from the lineage of Ham okay we come to understand that Ham lived on earth before the flood and knew the laws of the land quote unquote in those days in those days meaning before the flood and that after the flood, Ham committed a heinous sin. And we went over that, what that could have been. Wherever your interpretation falls under that, hey, it's open for debate. Whatever that heinous, um, Ham committed a heinous sin that got his son Canaan cursed, okay? In which we know them to have been Baal worshipers. We also know that Cush. Nimrod's father is known throughout history as Baal. So we see another connection to this family. A mysterious beginning to a great city. So where does Samaramis fit in? Okay, we're going to go over this character. Now, Samaramis we know as being the first false prophet. Okay, Samaramis. After I read this little description, you'll know why. Damaramis invented polytheism and with it, goddess worship. She was a queen consort and the mother of Nimrod. She becomes pregnant after engaging in an adulterous affair while married to Nimrod. Nimrod dies a violent and untimely death and in an effort to retain power and hide her misdeeds, she claims her deceased husband used, um, used his son rays to miraculously inseminate her with a child. This child was thus considered to be divinely conceived. The child's name was Tammuz, which she claimed was the reincarnation of Nimrod. Does that story sound familiar to you folks? Because it sure does to me. Okay, so goddess queen. History gets clouded in the origin of Samaramis' ancestors, and for a reason. We have to use our historical digging tools we have been using for this. Now, ancient Assyrian is a Semitic, Akkadian, Aramaic-speaking Mesopotamian people who lived in the kingdom of Assyria, which controlled northern Mesopotamia. Now, genetically, culturally, and linguistically, no different from the Babylonians. Both Assyrians and Babylonians originated from their parent empire, the Akkadian Empire. Okay, Think of Assyria and Babylon like the Union and Confederate States of America, also known as the North and the South. Samaramis, by many opinions, is believed to be totally fictitious and never really did exist. However, there does remain a three-side standing wall between the ancient Old and New Palace where a detailed etching of a curious hunting piece in which Samaramis on horseback is throwing her javelin at a leopard while her husband, Ninus, is piercing a lion. It is near this last palace that the famous hanging gardens were and so commonly celebrated by both Greeks and Italians. Notice here's another name for her husband besides Nimrod, it's Ninus. So, so far, we get that Samaramis was a legendary was the legendary wife of Onus, 
if I'm saying that correctly, if I'm not, I'm sorry. I'm not good with uh, these names. I'm going to mess up a lot of these names. Okay, so Samaramis was the, was the legendary wife of Onus and of Ninus, who succeeded the latter on the throne of Assyria. According to this man here, I'm, I'm assuming it's Moses, Moses, Corinthsatsi, legends narrated by Diodorus Siculus, who drew primarily from the works of that gentleman right there, of Nidus. Describe her and her relationships to Onus and King Ninus. Again, I apologize for tearing these names up. I'm not a scholar at this. Okay. okay. Onus, in legend, was one of the generals of the mythological Assyrian king Ninus. He married Samaram. He is said to have committed suicide after which his widow Ninus, after, excuse me, after which his widow married Ninus. Now, Ninus, who we're, we're going to say is a possible Antichrist, possibly Nimrod, because names, names are going to change in different stories here. According to Greek historians, writing in the Hellenistic period and later was the founder of Nineveh, also called the city of Ninus in Greek, the ancient capital of Assyria. Many early accomplishments are attributed, attributed to Ninus, such a training. Um, such as training the first hunting dogs and taming horses for riding. For this accomplishment, he is sometimes represented in Greek mythology as a centaur. He was said to have been the son of Belus or Bel, which we have said it was Cush, a name that may represent a Semitic title such as Baal, which is translated as Lord. The famous name of a god, quote unquote, whom Elijah opposed in 1 Kings chapter 17. Moving on here. The legend of Samaramis. Here's one, here's one story that, um, that I've discovered and it's pretty interesting. Okay. This legend um, that has branched out into many other cultures. Okay. This legend has branched out to many other cultures and which has found its ruling in different mythological disguises now seems to be preserved under the Syrian version, okay? Um, Siculus, who drew largely from this gentleman here, he tells us that in Ascalon, a part of Syria, a certain goddess was said to live in the lake near the town. Now, this goddess, Terketo, Terketo sometimes also known as Atagatis, had the upper portion of a woman, but the lower parts were that of a fish. Okay, we'll get back to that later. Okay. In other versions, she was simply a beautiful priestess, a maiden, total woman. It was told that Aphrodite, okay, and in Assyrian it would be Ashtaroth, the goddess of love, who bore a grudge against her, made her fall violently in love with a young Syrian called Castrus, by whom she gave birth to a daughter. After the latter's birth, Terketo, in her shame and guilt, exposed her child, did away with the father, and hid herself at the bottom of the lake. Excuse me. By an act of miracles, the doves found the infant and brought up the child, stealing the milk and later the cheese which she needed from nearby shepherds. Now, the shepherds finally discovered the little babe, who was of great beauty, hidden amongst the Arcacia shrubs, and brought her to their chief Simas of the royal herds, who now took her as his own to raise. He gave her the name Samaramis, which means in, which means in Syrian, the one who comes from the doves. As she grew to the age of nobility, one of the king's advisors and general Onus, remember we read about this guy earlier. Other titles used men in, okay, was ordered to inspect the flocks uh, when he noticed her surpassing beauty. Captivated by her splendor, innocence, and charm, he took her back with him to Nineveh and immediately married her. They had two children, supposed twins, okay, Hyapite and Hydaspe, 
if I said it correct, not right there on, on the um, slide. They seemed very happy, and Samaramis, being very clever, had given her husband such good advice that he succeeded in all his endeavors. At about the same time, King Ninus, who was ruler in Assyria, organized an expedition against neighboring Bactria. Knowing that this would not be an easy conquest, he collected an army of considerable size. After an initial setback, he managed to overwhelm the country uh, by the sheer number of his troops, and only the capital, Bactra, held out against him. Needing the aid of Onus, he sent for him. However, Onus, missing his beloved wife, asked her to join him. As she watched the battle, and after careful study, she uh, made several remarks about the way in which the siege was being conducted, noticing that the attack was being directed from the plain, while both attackers and defenders were ignoring the citadel. She asked to take charge of a group of mountain, mountain soldiers, having them scale the cliffs which defended the site and turn the flank of the of the enemy's defense. The besieged soldiers were terrified and solemnly did surrender. Ninus was magnificently engulfed with the admiration for the courage and skill Samaramis displayed. From the first moment that Ninus perused on her uh, that Ninus uh, perused on her winsome face and her astonishing beauty, he had found in her a charm. In his, uh, he had found in her a charm his heart was powerless to resist, and he was half subdued already to immediately resolve to her as his wife and queen. So, like there was something working behind the scenes for him to I found a charm in her and to already be half subdued already. Okay, he offered to give Onus her um, his own daughter, Sosana, in exchange for Samaramis, but Onus refused. Now Ninus then threatened to uh, then threatened to destroy Onus by gouging his eyes out. Whereupon, in fear, despair, and agony, he surrendered to his king's demand and unfortunately put an end to his life by hanging himself. Ninus then succeeded in marrying Samaramis without difficulty, and they had a son named Ninia. This sounds to me like there's more going on also than what they're talking about. Uh, Onus with a suicide. I think not. Okay. With her legendary story, quote unquote, we see how this uh, how we see how the biblical characters, um, that being the bloodline um, with a bloodline of Cush, Baal, on the verge of building a grand kingdom, fit in with her quote unquote divine story. We can see that she finds her way into and helps to build a system. Of true demonic origins. Okay, as a side note, I said we were going to go back to that uh, mermaid. A siren? We go back to the story here. A certain goddess was said to live in the lake near the town, but this goddess, Terketo, sometimes also known as Artagatis, had the upper portion of a woman, but the lower parts were that of a fish. Aphrodite made her fall violently in love with a young Syrian man um, called Castrus, by whom she gave birth to a daughter. Now, I know that the Book of Enoch is not canon, but it's mentioned a few times in Scripture, and I'm just going to mention it here because it fits in with this story here that's also not canon. It's just very... Uh, Curious. Now it says, and and Enoch nineteen one through two. It says, and Uriel said to me, and this is an angel speaking to Enoch. Here shall stand the angels who have connected themselves with women, and their spirits, assuming many different forms, are defiling mankind and shall lead them astray into sacrificing to demons. Okay, as gods, here shall they stand. Till the day of the great judgment in which they shall be judged till they are made an end of. And the women also um, of the angels who went astray shall become sirens. Very interesting. 
because this scripture here, <clears throat> excuse me, sorry, is speaking of the end. Okay, it's speaking of the those angels have the angels that have connected themselves with women, which we read in Genesis earlier. We read about the sons of God mixing with the women and um, producing, which we know as Nephilim. Okay, here it says the spirits assuming many different forms are defiling mankind and shall lead them astray into sacrificing to demons. Okay, as gods, meaning is the humans are going to think they're gods, but they're demons. It says here they shall stand till the day of the great judgment. We know the great judgment to be in the end. Okay. Here it's saying that the women also of the angels who went astray shall become sirens. Now, is this saying, is this saying that those women that they mixed and mingled with? Or is it saying that there's going to be angels that perceive to be women? Okay. We're not going to dig into the, into the book of Enoch. We're just gonna. I'm just gonna note that to prove a point here. Now, oh, I have some note things here. So, Durketto was a woman and a, and and siren. Okay, fish. Okay. With the data we have went over, we can assume that Samaramis is a Nephilim, or the product of a weird mixing between angels and mankind in the Genesis story, bringing about the spirituality. To the Babel bloodline. Those fallen ones who will come back uh, in the final judgment. Okay. If this story that we're reading, this mythological story that we're we got into of this Turketto, and she was a half person, half fish, and we would hear in Enoch that those become sirens. We know sirens as being a, a type of mermaid. Is this is, is she a part of this mixing? That's what I'm trying to assume here okay all right so babel was built there are many speculations on how the nephilim bloodline and the demonic spirits got on this side of the flood and we might never know but we can say is that there are details that we do not know i know that sounds kind of weird but you'll get my point right now who was ruling the world and what was the religion before the flood? Okay. Who were these women that the fallen angels chose? Who were the women of Noah's family and what was their history? All flesh was killed, but what about the spirits? Does Ham, who was alive before the flood, give us a clue to these questions? I believe that Babylon was built again. Whoever was ruling before found a way to rise again through the ranks of human civilization. Now we're going to get into the origin of, ba of mystery Babylon. Okay. I'm giving you a little bit of details on Nimrod's part, where there's a building, there's a building of a quote unquote great city rising. And we have this origin story of this queen, Samaramis, who is um, seems to be in the stories divine. Okay. So let's get let's get more into that. Okay. The first book of the Bible introduces this wicked man and his kingdom centered in babel the last book of the bible chapter 17 and 18 describes god's utter destruction of babylon in the last days the prophetic destruction includes the wicked city itself as well as the rebellious religion it generated okay now there's a dispute on chapter 17 and 18 and there's a dispute on is this a two is this two kingdoms? Is this two parts? Okay. I believe that it's two parts coming into one. Okay, we'll get more into that. Okay, this article will focus initially on Nimrod's wife Samaramis, as she was instrumental in the formation of the wicked quote unquote mystery religion of Babylon. It will then explain how Nimrod's father, Cush, and ultimately Nimrod 
himself were incorporated into this system of worship. Okay. Um, Euhemerus was an ancient Greek um, mythographer who lived around 300 BC. He wrote that gods and their associated legends arose from the deification of dead human heroes. Meaning is, people have took human heroes and made them into gods. One legend of ancient history regarding Samaramis describes Nimrod meeting Samaramis while she was a, and this is supposed to say brothel owner, I'm sorry, uh, was a brothel owner in Europe. Remember I remember I told you guys I, I we we go into an in-depth Bible study and I use this um this is the slide I used and I typoed right there. Okay. This probably occurred when Nimrod was consolidating control over that city. The history of queen slash goddess as prostitute slash brothel owner is not the material of good legends. Therefore, subsequent legends arose which portrayed her as a mythic fertility goddess and mother of the gods. All attempts to trace the origin of goddess worship led ultimately to one single woman of ancient history, Samaramis. She promoted deification of Nimrod and herself, uh, and herself after his death. God's judgment and Nimrod's execution forced the mystery religion underground for a while. And had its an adherents realized the danger of practicing their religion in the public domain. Hence, the name Mystery Religion of Babylon refers to its secretive nature. However, Samaramis command, commanded total authority over her subjects and clandestinely indoctrinated the priesthood with this mystery religion. Priests and astrologers obeyed her commands and aggressively marketed the mystery Bab mystery religion. Sorry, ancient Samar uh, ancient Sumerians knew Samaramis as the goddess Inanna. People adored her, especially in her home city of Aruk. They erected many temples to commemorate her as the goddess of sexual love and fertility. This description of her mythical duties was likely an exaggeration of her true life as a prostitute. Historical truth often grows to superhuman feats in mythology. Ancient mythology depicts Samaramis as ascending to heaven as a dove, where she became the fertility and queen goddess, Inanna. Okay, let me see here. Okay, Inanna's son and husband was Tammuz, the sun god. Sumerians worshipped the mother-son duo. After human dispersion at the Tower of Babel, Worship of the fertility goddess and mother-son duo continued across the ancient world, but the names changed in different locations due, of course, to the different languages. Inanna, who Samaramis, was known as Ishtar in Babylon, Isis in Egypt, and the sun husband was Osiris, the sun god. There is an inscription engraved in an Egyptian temple of Isis that reads, I am all that has been, or that is, or that shall be. What does that sound like, folks? No mortal has removed my veil. The fruit which I have brought forth is the sun. The sun was Osiris, deified Nimrod. Okay, I told you guys, there's a lot of stuff in here. Um, a lot of other rabbit holes, if you will, that you can go down. I'm just giving you a brief summary of some stuff that I found in my research. She was worshipped as Venus in Rome, counterpart Cupid, and Aphrodite in Greece. She was also called Diana, Artemis, great fertility goddess of the Ephesians. Worship of this goddess became a roadblock in the Apostle Paul's early mission to the city of Ephesus as mentioned in the book of Acts, chapter 19, verses 23 through 41. The Old Testament records the name of this fertility goddess of the Canaanites as Ashtaroth, Baal's counterpart. Okay, She became a stumbling block 
for the Jews and their leaders who first settled this area for many generations. The prophet Jeremiah prophesied about this worship, about the worship of this goddess. In Jeremiah 44, 19 through 23, it says the woman added, when we burned in, the women added, when we burnt incense to the queen of heaven and poured out drink offerings to her, did not our husbands know that we were making cakes like her image and pouring out drink offerings to her? Then Jeremiah said to all the people, both men and women, who were answering him. Did not the Lord remember and think about the incense burned and the towns of Judah and the streets of Jerusalem by you and your fathers, your kings and your officials and the people of the land? When the Lord could no longer endure your wicked actions and the detestable things you did, your land became an object of cursing and a desolate and desolate and a desolate, sorry, was without inhabitants as it is today. Because you have burned incense and have sinned against the Lord and have not obeyed him or followed his law uh, or his decrees or his stipulations, this disaster has come upon you as you now see. Now, as we read scripture like this, people who just skim the top of the Bible and don't really think about this, who are thinking in the Western modern way, don't really think of what were they doing. It says, the Lord says that um, when the Lord could no longer endure your wicked actions and detestable things, what are these things that they are doing? Okay. You got to go back into the ancient Eastern and figure an Eastern perspective and see what, what were these things that they were doing. When we worship God, we worship God in a certain way. When they worship their quote unquote gods, which are demons, how do they worship them? The question I'm going to leave you guys with for a minute here. All right. Samaramis became a powerful ruler in Mesopotamia following the death of Nimrod. The Sumerian name Samuramat was the original name of this woman. This suggests the ancient civilization of Samaria may have taken their name from her. The name Samuramat is translated the gift of the sea. Remember that story we read, that, that mythological story we read. Um, the first part of this name, Samur, becomes Shinar when translated into Hebrew. The land, the land uh, uh, of Shinar is the biblical name for the region of southern Mesopotamia. Both the Sumerians and their land of Shinar were likely named after this notorious woman. Most anthropologists credit the Sumerians with the beginning of human civilization. Now, I know a lot of these things can be contested, and we can go back and forth. I'm not going to do that. We're just getting we're getting somewhere here. Samaramis ruled for more than 40 years after Nimrod's death. Her son was likely Gilgamesh, and he ruled after her. The famous Gilgamesh epic is quite similar to the biblical flood story, except he is the central figure. The mystery. Religion of Babylon probably originated in the evil mind of Samaramis. Nimrod and Cush also contributed significantly to its development. Many learned individuals have taught polytheism was evolutionary, was the evolutionary forerunner to monotheism. However, polytheism began in the minds of Cush, Nimrod, and Samaramis, who heavily suffused the mystery religion of Babylon with human. Deification. Deified Cush was revered as several gods of ancient mythology. Remember, Cush was the was um, Ham's son. Ham is Nimrod's. I mean, not Nimrod. Ham was Noah's son. Okay. Uh, Deified Cush was revered as as several gods of ancient mythology. Canaanites worshipped him as Bel or Baal. And he was their most important god. Baal worship was an abomination to God and a major factor provoking his judgment on the Canaanites and Israelites. The prophet Jeremiah spoke the word of God to the Israelites who had participated in Baal worship. We just read some of that in the previous slide. Okay, warning. This is my assumption and my speculation. 
I'm not saying this is scripture, this is canon. I'm saying this is my own crazy mind. Okay, I come up, I come up with a conclusion. I try to logically come up with a conclusion of what's going on. I put together all the studies that I've done, all the Bible reading that I've done, praying that I've done, everything, and try to come up with a logical explanation. If that's correct or not, I guess we'll find out in the in the future. Okay, so my assumption is speculation. Now, before the flood, okay, before the flood, before the times, I mean, be, sorry, between the times of Adam and Noah, okay, the fallen angels had a political and religious system that worshiped who we call Satan. This system made the entire earth and everything in it corrupt. Okay. Now, God destroyed the flesh. But not the fallen angel. Okay. Scripture says that God imprisoned imprisoned them. Okay. Nor their offspring spirits, meaning hybrids, Nephilim, demons, whatever you want to call them. Okay. Who wander the earth in the spirit realm. These spirits found somebody, possibly Ham, to knowingly or unknowingly commit. Some kind of act, okay, some kind of witchcraft, to bring back the fallen angels' offspring back into the world, interdimension. Okay, let me explain a little more. So God destroyed the flesh in the flood, but He imprisoned the fallen angels, the original, the original fallen, the originals that came down and mixed with the with the women. Okay, now they had we read that they had offspring. Okay, a lot of this can be debated. Like I said, this is my speculation. They had offspring. Now, when the flood happened, it killed them too. Now, their spirits are wandering in the spirit realm on earth still. Okay. Now, those spirits found somebody who knew about this kind of political and religious system that was before the flood to do something, some kind of act to start allowing these um, the offspring of the fallen angels to come back into this world, into this dimension, into the material. The spirit who has claimed the name of Samaramis, the false prophet, is one of those offspring, Nephilim or demons, the first to come through and help start a corrupt bloodline through Cush and Canaan. This spirit, through time, is developing a system, releasing other demons and ultimately opening the realm for the fallen ones and Satan himself, uniting Satan with the proper bloodline to rule the world. Okay, that was my speculation. Okay, Samaramus is the first one to come through that um, dimensional barrier between the spiritual and the material. She's the first one to come through with the help of Ham. And ever since then, Throughout time, we've been having people bringing through those demons with witchcraft and all the rest of the um, religions or whatever you want to call them. And uh, sacrifices and all that kind of stuff. All right. So this evil spirit will be passing, will be passing, there will be a passing of the torch of a dark kingdom, okay, that once ruled the earth when Satan possesses the bloodline and the Antichrist. Read that again. This evil spirit will be passing of the torch of a dark kingdom that once ruled the earth when Satan possesses the bloodline of the Antichrist, the Nimrod blood. Okay. So in the future, there will be a passing of the torch. We'll get into that more later. Demons taking people's identities through possession, tricking mankind. Now, here's is this is a sick, is a sick demonic fairy tale. Okay. In a sick demonic fairy tale. Her king and husband dies tragically, only to be only to be reborn through her, a father in the son, now a god. While he is coming of age, she will rule in his steed until the right time when she will sacrifice all for him to rightfully rule again, reclaiming his kingdom now as a god of a one government, one religion. But we know the real story. The real God 
is on the throne and will reconcile his entire creation through his son, Jesus Christ. Satan is a mere pawn, and Satan's plan is a mere piece of the puzzle to God's ultimate plan of redemption. Okay, so that's it for this one. Um, we're going to get into the second part very soon. So stay tuned. I hope you guys enjoyed this one, and I'll see you on the next one.